But my goal is to find something like that that I can do every time because hey, it's their celebration. Peter. Yes. Uh, you did work in radio, right? That's correct. I bet you that any program director that you worked for never allowed you to be that creative. <laughs> um, I had one who allowed me to, but that's because they gave me some airtime in the morning to do what I wanted. I wasn't on your typical radio station. I worked on K I worked on KBRT AM 740. They're a daytime only uh, Christian talk radio station, and uh, I wound up uh, getting to do whatever I wanted in the mornings because I turned on the station and I was all by myself for an hour and a half before anybody got there. And uh, so they gave me about a half hour of airtime. So I started creating little things like. Since it was a Christian station, I created the Surfer's Daily Devotional with Nikki Shred. And uh, all kinds of little fun things that, you know, he'd read about how Jesus walked on water. And he's like, that means he can surf wherever he wants. He doesn't even need a surfboard. You know, so we just did all kinds of crazy stuff like that. We did, um, uh, we, we did our own version of Religion Line, which is very much like Movie Line. You'd call up and it would give you four options and you'd press the keypad and, and it would tell you something about the religion in the movie phone voice, you know. And... So just all kinds of fun stuff like that. and But I, I didn't get to do that for very long. Um, I wound up finally getting my own talk show for a while, and I had to kind of tone it back a little bit when I did that. Yeah, the reason why I was thinking about that and the reason why I bring it up was because uh, uh, I ran radio stations for years, and I was always looking for people who were creative. And if you'd have walked into my office with an idea like that, then I would have been like, yeah, let's do it, do it, do it. And it was always interesting because usually when I did find somebody who was extraordinarily creative, they were always so surprised that I was even interested in letting them do it, uh, which is off the subject, but it, would, it, just, it just hit me how creative that was and what a great idea to, to mix that song in together. Uh, and that sort of dedication, you know, that you just don't find that in entertainers. You just, if you don't see that. It's very rare these days. Many, many years ago, MCs, Masters of Ceremonies, uh, you know, uh, people that did the, the mobile stuff, that was more prevalent because it was encouraged. But in today's market, especially when you get a lot of people who are doing mobile services that come out of the radio industry and creativity is so suppressed in the radio industry, um, it just makes your book even a more valuable resource uh, simply because of the fact that that sort of creativity has not been um, encouraged for many, many years. I completely agree with you. In fact, one of my favorite stations I like to listen to today is Jack FM. And the most creative thing they have is the liner notes where the guy makes jokes about the fact that they don't take requests. Um, and it, and it, it doesn't even compare to what I loved as a kid when I first discovered the Top 40 station, KMBQ in Seattle. And they had Mark Allen on there who talked about how he was, you know, currently DJing the show completely nude. And, uh, and, and he'd sing his own versions of songs, you know, went to a party last Saturday night. Prince was there. His jeans were tight. Uh-huh. It ain't no big thing. And he would do stuff like that all the time. He'd, he'd answer the phone pretending to be somebody else and tape record the conversation and play it back and, and I used to listen to him and think, you know what, that's a fun job. And nowadays, you're right, most radio, they're just not having fun in the booth anymore. Guess what? If, if it's the Mark Allen that I'm thinking of, he's on my Facebook friends list. Really? Yes. If, if he was a DJ on KMBQ, I'd love, to, I'd love to meet him. If you could introduce I, me, I'd be thrilled. I'm still a fan. I will find out. I will definitely I, find out and let you know. I, I, uh, he's a cur if it's the same guy, he's currently in Nashville. Every every, uh, every every Friday at 5 o'clock, he'd say it's quitting time, and he'd play Working for the Weekend by Loverboy, and I would crank that thing while I was driving my van for U.S. Bank. It was awesome. That used to be a big tradition. We did that at a, lot, uh, a couple of the stations that I programmed, and uh, it's funny you were talking about the nude thing because uh, totally off the subject, but uh, I once worked uh, with a uh, disc jockey who shall, re who shall re remain nameless, <laughs> and I was doing the afternoon show, and this guy was the 7 to midnight guy, and he was supposed to be fun, you know. And uh, uh, what happened was is that uh, during my last break, before I introduced him, I said, well, Jerry's coming up next, and Jerry was talking to the boss today, and uh, the boss said he need to put more, some more excitement in the show, ladies and gentlemen. So coming up this evening, Jerry will be doing the entire show completely naked and had the studio audience and everything, and here's where I'm going back to this creativity. I just gave this guy an hour and a half of material. Right. No, he heard it. He never picked up on it. <laughs> wow. He didn't say a word about it after the thing. I'm like, if it was me and I heard somebody introduce me that way, I'd walk in and go, yeah, man, I got the little chili in here. I mean, I'd do something every break, but anyway. Right. Yep. <laughs> and that goes back to, you know, like we talked about, you know, going from being a DJ to being an entertainer, 
and more mm-hmm. importantly for a bride and a groom who are looking to take what is one of their most important days of their entire life together uh, and taking it from what could be to what should be. Right. And uh, I, I got to tell you, uh, you're you're actually going to get a little blurb on uh, the Rock Weekly uh, that uh, the interview that we uh, just did this week. We actually gave you some some props and some inf- uh, some notability on on that interview because we thought it was very important because this is a big day for you. I mean, we're we're on the last Friday of your life before you're going to go and become the published author of of what I consider the next decade. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know that that'll be that big, but I have to tell you, uh, I've already got my Tuesday planned out. I'm going to be speaking that night to my local ADJ chapter, doing a new seminar called Make It Fun that outlines some of the creative ideas in the book. But before I show up at that chapter meeting, I'm planning to go to at least five bookstores with a video camera in hand. I want to go in and find the book on the shelf, walk it up front and buy it on video while they try to figure out why in the world I'm videotaping it. And uh, that's what I'm going to do to amuse myself on Tuesday because I couldn't be more excited about the fact that it's going to be in bookstores. Well, we are certainly proud as all heck for you. Uh, th- this is a big day for you. It's a big day for the industry. As you said, you pushed 11,000 ho- 11, units on your own. Uh, but this thing is going to go big. When, when we're talking about you know a published book hitting every – major newsstand in the, in the United States and, and, and online uh, bookstores. Uh, if you don't have a, a, the original copy, this one right here, ladies and gentlemen, you need to go get the, 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 the version two of this book and read it. I'm telling you, I've got this book and I hold it like a Bible, right? You know, because you know, I could go back to this thing, even though it's the first revision, and get ideas each and every time. One of the neatest things that, you know, Peter, uh, you told me one time was, was the um, – the difference between the importance of the veggie platter, and and that stuck on my mind for years because as I as I got entrenched into the wedding entertainment industry, I really didn't believe that a wedding a veggie platter cost that much. Uh, <laughs> and and then I'm sitting down with the event halls and, and the in the, the the catering companies, and you know I just asked the question, is it yep. really that much? And they said, yeah. Oh and, yeah, yeah. And, and and I can't take credit for that idea. That idea came from Mark Farrell with his Getting What You're Worth uh, series that he started back in 1998, and he used it to wake DJs up to the fact that they are undervaluing the the price and value of their services drastically. And here well, we are. Put it, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt that's anybody. Okay. That's a problem in the entertain, in, in entertainment industry anyway. No, I agree. I mean, that is a major issue. That's a major issue across the board, and uh, – and, that that a lot of the times people in the industry undervalue themselves, and uh, you know you need to get your product out there and you need to uh, do what you've done, which is to package it in such a way that you show people this is what you're going to get. It's worth what you pay for. That's right. Well, I, and I tell people on uh, on my blog, uh, DJs say the darndest things. One of the first articles I wrote was about the most expensive wedding DJ I've heard of so far. His name's DJ Cassidy out of New York City, and his prices start at 25000 plus travel and equipment rental. And uh, this was in an ad that was in the New York Wedding Magazine, and after it said 25000 in parentheses it said, no, this is not a typo. Uh, this <laughs> oh, is the, my God. The, this, this is the guy who, when, he, when Jay-Z and Beyonce got married, they called DJ Cassidy. And DJ Cassidy will probably more freely than I could tell you admit that he's not a wedding master of ceremonies. He is an extremely talented club jock who does amazing mixes, and they hire him to be the music for $25,000. Wow. So when DJs are freaking out about what I charge, they don't even realize that I'm not even close to what the top of the uh, top of the heap looks like yet. And that guy isn't even a, a master full master of ceremonies. He'll make generic announcements, but he's not doing the, the kind of grand entrances that I do or that other wedding entertainment directors do. Uh, he isn't making it that personal. He's just there to spin tunes exceptionally well. So good for him. You know how he did it? He's got an agent. Yeah. Yeah. You know, beat mixer, battle mixer, uh, uh, battle scratcher. You know, and, and you know he he DJ one of the biggest weddings of this you know decade. And uh, I think that goes back to figuring out what you, the entertainer, uh, are worth and, and really looking at what you do in value points uh, to the overall success of the event. And I know that's one of, your, one of your, your words to me back when I was just getting started in the industry. I was charging way too little. Um, and uh, I thought that I was doing okay. You know, I would have you know, back-to-back-to-back events, but uh, you know, I could have done less events 
more selective events, uh, getting paid more of what I thought was my value of that event, and uh, and, and not only that, but uh, it, getting out of the greed for myself, making sure that the event for the couple that was getting married was going to be successful and enjoyable. You know, the, the I tell people when you're you're paying. Uh, twenty-five dollars plus a head sometimes uh, for an event as a wedding. You don't want your guest walking out the front door thirty minutes into the event. <laughs> That's right. You know, so yep. th- it's 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 a it's a big deal. And I've I've had weddings where uh, they were more on the high budget end, and they actually had a full tilt band playing for the dancing, but they still hired me to come in and be the master of ceremonies and to run their ceremony, and they paid my full price. Uh, so just because I got to take a break while the band was playing didn't mean I had to work any less and I could have gotten my full price for that day and worked for somebody else. So they saw the value, they paid the price and they were thrilled to have me. And I had a lot of fun working with their band too. They were actually a very good band. Uh, exactly. And that was one of the questions in the chat room was what happened to real bands and, 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 and <laughs> proper hi-fi systems, right? And, and I don't think that it's the fact that real bands have gone away. You know, they're out there. You go to any club on any Friday, Saturday night or Thursdays and see these bands playing problem is is most of them are cover bands and they mm-hmm. play a specific genre or or branch of music and that's all they're going to give you right and and i was actually doing a wedding much like yours i did a a greek wedding one time where they had the greek band in there plus myself and we would go back and forth throughout the evening the, the wedding ended up being a 12-hour wedding reception but uh it, it was nonetheless a very enjoyable time and we we both had a great time interacting and, and throwing back and forth to each other yeah, yeah, and the band that I worked with was actually an '80s cover band. They called themselves the Spasmatics, and they oh, dress yeah, like yeah, the Spasmatics. They, they, yeah, they dress like nerds, and they put on an amazing show. But it is very much geared towards a, stuff from the '80s only. So when the bride and groom wanted current hip hop, that was on my shoulders. Absolutely. So, so there you have it. Uh, I mean, so if you could kind of wrap up and sum up the book, you know, the book <laughs> that's hitting the stores on Tuesday, October the twelfth. Give us kind of your last thoughts. Uh, around this because i really want people to go out to the bookstores and and not just to support you but to support the industry and get this book and read it right even if you go in there get a cup of coffee and sit down and read it uh you know you're you're going to see the value of the the message inside of it so well the message of the book is broken into three simple parts the first part is all about putting together a good team because you need to pick your vendors from the point of view of will this make my party fun if you get a photographer who runs late that can kill your party faster than anything the second section is all about building a game plan a reception agenda that'll flow smoothly and take into consideration the norms for your area there are different norms for an agenda in different parts of the country and i give examples in that section of the book and i even talk about plan b's for bad weather and delays and then the third section of the book is 230 creative ideas to make the wedding more fun. We were talking about grand entrances. The chapter on grand entrances has 29 different ideas for making the grand entrance more personal, unique, memorable, and fun. So uh, if you want to get a whole bunch of new ideas to be able to offer to your clients, if you want to be able to pull something new out of the toolbox, heck, if you just want to start thinking of your own creative ideas, nothing will get you thinking more creatively than exposing yourself to some more new creative ideas you haven't considered before. That's where some of these best ideas have come from, is thinking about other ideas, and then that branches into a new one. So if you want to help your brides and grooms create a day that's fun, memorable, and unique, you need to encourage them to get a copy of this book. And as a wedding entertainer, I'd highly encourage you to get it so that you're ready to start offering them some of these ideas too. And you're not caught off guard when they say, hey, here's what we'd like. Uh, So, you know, do me a favor. Go pick up a book for yourself. Tell your brides and grooms to get one. Uh, Let's get this book in as many brides' hands as we can so that they start recognizing that the entertainment really is the thing that everybody says makes or breaks the event. But now they truly understand why, and they're ready to make a better decision, and that will benefit all of us absolutely hey, peter. so peter, peter thank you so much for being on the show uh we, we we couldn't thank you enough uh you know this is something that you know i would arguably be say that i would stand in line and pay to listen to uh so um <laughs> but if you've missed the you know the, this interview if you're watching this on on replay go back to the beginning uh you see this whole interview on demand uh it's going to be there 24 7 365 we're also going to excerpt this out throw it up on the youtube channel uh we're also going to be linking over on our past guest link at the top of the page, we're going to be linking over to Peter's uh, website, The Best Wedding Reception Ever, and uh, definitely take a look at that. Get out to the bookstores on Tuesday and pick yourself up a copy of The Best Wedding Reception Ever. Thanks, Peter, guys. Peter, thank you so much, and we'll be talking with you soon. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Take care. Very nice to have you.